You're listening to the No Labels, No Limits podcast with best-selling author Sarah Box, where you get the inside scoop on the steps action takers and decision makers take to align their purpose to their principles and achieve their goals in business and life. We focus on the mantra, no labels, no limits, no excuses. And now, without further ado, please welcome your commanding coach with plenty of chutzpah and heart, Sarah Box. Hey there, No Labels, No Limits podcast listeners, welcome back. I'm Sarah Bach, your host of the No Labels, No Limits podcast, where you know that we are on a mission to help individuals, teams, and organizations think outside the box, move beyond limiting beliefs, and create profound impact in their own lives and lives of others. And we do this, you know, by sharing a wide variety of accomplished and inspiring guests who have challenged their own limiting labels and beliefs they're pursuing and accomplishing their own personal and professional goals, and frankly, just not accept, accepting the status quo. So today we're joined by Maria Quatron, who is a great example of that. She embodies the spirit of this podcast, and she has this relentless dedication to her career in real estate spanning nearly two decades. She shattered labels and limits, carving a path in a traditionally male-dominated industry. Her journey from a native of Philadelphia to becoming the founder and CEO of Maria Quatron and Associates Remax, At Home and Motto Mortgage Expert Solutions showcases her ability to break down barriers, but go beyond that and thrive. Her success story is a testament to how perseverance, determination, and a refusal to be limited by norms can lead to an extraordinary life of achievement. So now let's officially welcome Maria Quatron to the podcast. Hey, Maria. Hi, Sarah. Thank you so much for the opportunity to spend some time with you today. Well, I'm happy to have you on the show. And I'm going to tell you, you're a little bit different guest because you come from a different uh, professional background than many of our guests, which I think is a huge opportunity for us to learn from you. You know, you've built your organization, your company, and you have a team of people that you work with, associates, um, people that you work with outside of your own business. So I want to ask you just kind of um, as a kickoff question, what kind of things, you know, have you learned in building your real estate group that you think could benefit business leaders regardless of their business type? You know, like what have you learned that you think and regardless of whatever you're doing in business, here's a couple of things that I've learned that really make a difference. Well, Rome wasn't built in a day or a week or a month or in a year. So having a long-term plan is really important and thinking about like how long that you intend to be in whatever business that you're in and thinking about when you're making decisions, will this affect me in a positive or negative way 20 years from now? And that's something that, you know, in the moment of being uh, sometimes, especially in real estate, emotional, we make bad decisions. Because we wanted to win the argument, but winning the argument costs a, costs a relationship, right? So even if you win, you lose. I think that's something that's really important. Like to really think about how you respond and um, doing, I'm going to say the right thing, because the right thing is you should always be doing that. But sometimes it means that you will lose. You will you will lose. And so that's the one thing I think that, you know, you're going to have through this journey of life. I've reinvented myself probably in the real estate over the last 20 years, probably four times. So know that, you know, you, you're going to have to pivot and you're going to have to reinvent yourself. And, you know, in order to grow also, it's extremely important that you become vulnerable um, with humility with grace and the, the faster that you can learn that lesson and treat people as like, you know, that golden rule, how you want to be treated. And it sounds like so cliche, 
But I think that people forget, really forget about the basic things. So you know, that's like, so important. A couple of questions I want to follow up with you on that. So you've reinvented yourself. And I think a lot of times we hesitate to want to reinvent ourselves, right? It's like, well, then if I become this, what, what was the use of all that preceded it, right? We can hang on too long. So can you give an example of one of your reinventions? Sure. I was running uh, a team at another brokerage. It was my team uh, back in 2013. And I had the idea to open and purchase a Remax franchise. And the company found out. And I was asked to leave my company that I was with for almost eight years. I was humiliated um, by the whole experience and how it happened. And my listings were stuck there. And it was very, very traumatic for me, emotionally, mentally, even physically. Like my body ached um, from the breakup. And I wasn't prepared yet to buy the Remax. It, I didn't have any plans and nothing was in place, no office, nothing. And uh, my livelihood and those in my organization um, was detrimentally affected. And so I was able to get the company, new company open in like a six week period, which is actually that I was able to do that. Um, and then, though, because of what happened, there was a lot of gossip and rumors that I actually did something wrong, um, which I didn't. And it was be just extremely devastating emotionally. And I still got up and I still did my work. But my whole team kind of split up. So I had to start all over again. And now I own a real estate brokerage and I have no idea what I'm doing. And I don't know how to run a brokerage and I'm not an ops person. So it was a big struggle um, for a while, many years in fact. And I had to figure out like how to navigate this new situation that I'm in as a, as a business owner and not just a team leader. Team leader in an organization, you're not responsible for a lot of other things uh, that you are as a business owner. And it was really very, very difficult. And, but, you know, here I am and you just keep going, figure it out. Everything's figure, figure outable. It, figure outable. I know. Very I like that word. Assessment. Everything's figure outable. Um, Everything's figure outable. Eventually, right? If we if we just don't throw our hands up and quit. But I yes. have to commend you. That's a huge undertaking to go from being a leader, a team leader, to being like a, a organization leader, a business owner leader, um, and having other people depend on you and all of that. There's just a different level of responsibility and paying attention to details that are different in addition to the work you're doing. So what did you get any support for yourself or did you just kind of pull yourself along and go give yourself pep talks and get up? Come on, we got this, Maria. Yeah, that's kind of how it happened. Luckily, I love to listen to podcasts and motivational things. So I use that. Um, have some support from friends, but not anything formal. Um, and of course, I had to hire people, which, you know, I already had people, but through the whole mess of it, I had to rehire people. And it was it was pretty crazy. It was um, it was a tough time. Yeah. So if I were starting out and I I came to you, Right. And I'm in a similar position as you were then. What would you tell me about making that leap that the Maria didn't know at the time? I would tell you not to do it. To stay put? I, I may tell you to stay put. 
it's very, very hard. And um, unless you're going to continue being in sales yourself, you will make a lot less money as a you're owning your own brokerage. Unless you were able to, you know, blow it up to hundreds of agents. So you really, really need to think long and hard about what your it's in it, it's based on the individual too. Like if you're more sales or you're more ops, you if you're not ops, you have the support of somebody who can be the operations director. Uh, that's really, really important. Otherwise, you're going to be spending time doing that for, part of it, and your sales will suffer, and your recruiting will suffer. You need to constantly attract, you know, agents to your company. Um, and there's always going to be attrition. So it is a business where I think harder even now to do it than back then because of the way that the market is today. How would you describe today's market, Maria? I know we've had a lot of changes over the past few yes. years. Um, but I, and from an outsider looking in, it's like, I'm not sure how I would summarize all those changes. I know how they affect me as a buyer or seller, having been both not that long ago, um, but not from your side of the street, if you will. So there's definitely not enough inventory. I call it, instead of we used to call like the entry level and the luxury level, the tail of two markets, it's the tail of many markets today. So if you have the houses that sell first are the ones in the best location and condition. Um, single family homes are much, do much better than uh, attached homes. And the price point um, really doesn't matter in the single family home. If it's 500 or if it's 900, they're all gonna go over asking price. And then that's, right outside of Philadelphia, I'm talking about. And then in Philadelphia, in the city, a lot of things are sitting on the market for a long time. And then in one area in the city, there's no inventory. And if it comes up, it's sold in a day. So it is so crazy. The different, how every area and every price point and everything is different. It's never really been like this. Days on market are up. There's 61 days on market. Year over year, we're down 25% in closed transactions, down 25% in pendings, down 15% in active listings. And uh, the market, though, overall, the Philadelphia metro market is up 4.3% in price. So the issue is this. 83% of people have mortgages under 5%. And they don't want to lose their 5% or under interest rate yeah. to sell, to pay 7%. And especially if you have 3%, 3%, then you definitely don't want to pay 7%. So those first time home buyers who would be move up buyers, sellers, Sell, move, move up sellers and be a next second home buyer. That inventory is not there. In addition to that, millennials are the hottest, I guess, the strongest age where they purchase real estate. So there are new household formations that will come over the next five years. We do not have enough inventory just based on that. So this is a long-term problem. Today, the three main reasons that somebody is uh, selling their home are divorce, death, and relocation. Other than that, people are, are staying put where they are. So, you know, on, from our perspective, we have to speak to more people, have more conversations. Only 7% of real estate agents, realtors were in the business in 2008 that are in the business still today. Only that's 7%. huge. That's a huge loss of um, agents. Yes. So a lot of the agents came after 13. And the market since 2011, this one like this, up and up. So 
when things are up and up and there's buyers and sellers, it's a lot easier. And, you know, that's why a lot of people got into the industry. But, and it's interesting because we had thought more would have exited by now, self-select exit, and they have not yet. So I think some of that is people made a lot of money over the last couple of years, possibly, and they're holding on. And I'm not really sure 100% where that's going, but we'll see more by the end of the year who's going to renew their license. Next year is a renewal year, as well as every year you have to renew your board, like, you know, your uh, use to NAR and, and PAR, and for us it's called GPARs. That's, in a nutshell, uh, what's going on with the real estate. Well, it's, it's similar out here, and um, out here is out west. I mean, it's an ongoing conversation. If you sell your house, what are you going to get for that money If you, unless you're leaving the area, right? Like we are selling, leaving the area. That's and right. You have to be willing to leave or you're not going to get the same value that you're selling because the stuff that's available is not, it's just higher price for less value. So oh, yes. I, I, you're right. And the interest rate is a concern for folks. Like, I don't know. I'm, I'm doing good right where I'm at. Thanks. I'll, it I'll is. It is. And then it does, though, if you are, I will, I will, I want to put in the, in the podcast says, if you are a first time buyer and you can afford to buy and you're credit worthy, buy a property. Because the prices will still continue to go up. And it, right now, you pay 100% rent to your landlord. So you have no, no mortgage. If you pay theirs. So you have no equity. Buy. If you are an empty nester, so you got a big house, you made a lot of equity over the last several years. Downsize. Still continue to downsize. Right, you made you're making more money than you thought you ever would have on this house. And you're gonna buy a smaller place, so the interest rate will be more, but your payment probably will be a, a lot less anyway, even at higher rate. And you can keep going on. You don't need a five thousand square foot house for two people. Um, but there are, those people are also holding on. Yeah. So you know, I say you really need to look at each situation and see. And if it, there's a death, nobody wants to deal with the house, with the estate and all that. So nobody's, unless they're like second time homes and they're at the beach or something. Regular houses, people want, they don't have, there's usually many heirs. And then there's all these things that have to happen with the house. And it's not... Nobody wants the house, so they have to sell that house too. So that's an opportunity. Yes, death, divorce, and people moving out of state either because they're retiring or or job relocation. You know, it's a really great thing you brought up was like if you don't have a house, right? You're paying all your money to a landlord, and you are able to buy something to do it. And I re that's exactly where I was at with my first house. And at that time, the markets, the interest rate was eight and a half percent eight and a half percent i mean today when i'm thinking oh man it's going right back up there but it's been this high before and it wasn't pretty you know but it's doable um depending on the type of mortgage you have so that's just to have something that you're right you're invested and have something you're building for yourself rather than building it for someone else is a good reminder to folks who on average homeowners have $238,000 is net worth and renters have five. Yeah, that's a big difference. A big difference. So, so we are, we're all about moving people into home ownership. You know, we need to get their credit cleaned up if it needs to be and get into a house, even if it's not the perfect, most perfect house, nobody gets getting a perfect house. So, you know, you're going to get something you need to maybe paint and makes a little bit of repairs, and maybe a little dated, but it's more important to be a homeowner. And it can actually be kind of fun to do some of that stuff, unless the house and the bones are bad or it's falling apart is one thing, but fixing it up and making it your house can be really fun. Hey there, everybody. I want to take just a minute out of this episode of the No Labels 
No Limits podcast to tell you that we are officially opening the Sandbox membership in September. So if you're not already on our mailing list, please click the link below to either sign up for the membership or get on the waiting list for the membership. And if you click the link, you'll find more information about what's included, what our plans are, and better yet, you'll be on early enough to help decide what is most important to you to experience in the first three to six months of the membership. So don't wait. Click the link below and join us in the sandbox where fun happens. We get to do a little R&R, &R, a little learning, support one another, and really grow and expand in ourselves, in our lives, and impact the world in a profound way. So come on over, join us. You said something, not just now, but when I was reading, that you said you are your only competition. We, do you remember that? Yes, that's Can one of my talk fears. talk about that? Yeah, I love are that. Yourself. You are your only competition. So we really don't have competitors. The only competitor is yourself. Because everybody comes from different walks of life. Everybody has different experiences. Everybody's education is different. Or they could have, say, in my case, they could have grown up in real estate. Their family was in real estate. They went to a real estate office every day. I'm sure they know maybe more than me about it, or they're further along than me. I don't know. But anyway, the only person that you compete against is the person in the mirror. And if you're not where you want to be today, instead of keeping the mirror down here, pick it up and look into it. Because we get to control our own destin destiny and manifest whatever it is we want. I listened to episode, let's see, I wrote it down here. Dr. Mary Ann Mercer, Create Your Best Life, episode 307. And she talked about her desires and dreams to be on Oprah. I was like, wow, she was on Oprah? How cool is that? But she, she manifests that. Like, how, and, then, and then she has all these, what's all that, all those boxes? They're books that people would send to Oprah, right? So. I thought that was really interesting how she got on there. And also she talked about um, how you grow through difficult times. And I just had some personal things um, this year, last year into this year that happened. Very difficult, very difficult things. And uh, to persevere through it, but it gave me perspective. And it gave me vulnerability and humility. And I learned tremendous amount from the experience. And not everybody, unfortunately, gets to take good from it. I do believe that uh, Amari Fati, so love, the love of fate for itself that through life we experience things that whether they're good or bad or not that should teach us a lesson or that we need to know for somewhere in the future of our life that we don't know that's going to happen yet and how to maneuver through them so it's kind and, of like a stepping stone in your mind like that little thing if we don't know why it applies it well may but I can give a little bit of an example. Please do. I was on my way to Italy. I left my wallet in the taxi cab. It was a long black one where you put the passport in. And when I went to pay him, I used my credit card, but I wanted to give him a $5 tip in cash. And when I was doing all this, you know, you have luggage, bag, and I'm all dressed up nice, go in my business class seat to Italy by myself and I get out and I get into the airport and I go to check in and no one. Whoa. And this was about 15, it's gotta be 18 years ago, 
It's a long time. It, there was no Uber. So I maneuvered myself to the police station at the airport. And what I found out was the police are pretty bored at the airport. There's not a lot going on usually unless somebody leaves a bag, which I did that another time. My pocketbook, I left there in a state of confusion. Uh, you know, then they have to like see if there's a bomb in the bag. Outside of those things, there's not a lot of exciting stuff that happens at an airport. People are usually on better behavior than normal. So long and short is a, they, a, we called Amex. We got the medallion number for the cab. And then the police called the cab guy, the cabbie. And he's like, you have her a while. You need to come back here now. And he's like, no, I'll drop it tomorrow. And the police captain said, you don't come back here now with that wallet. You're not going to be able to take any rides for 30 days because the police, which I didn't know this, controlled the taxi service. So all this stuff, right? Nonsense. But there was a situation in my family a couple years ago where we had to get a family member. She was going to go on a plane and we had to get her to not go on a plane. So I knew that if we went to the police, that they wouldn't be doing anything um, and they would be able to help us. And I knew exactly like where to go and like, uh, and that, guess what? They were able to help us and we were able to, we were able to have yeah. her not, not go on the plane. Yeah. So but yeah, that, to... that experience without the money and the wallet. Oh, yeah, I missed my plane, and I had to come back the next day at the same time, like Grandpa Day. And the whole experience took four hours to get the wild back. Oh, I was yeah. there for four hours. But I wouldn't have known about the police at the airport and how, like, they're really great to work with. And that, that experience so long ago, led me to be able to go to them and know that they could help us. I know it sounds a little maybe crazy, but I knew, like, okay, we're going to go there, say this. We have um, the paperwork that we needed to give them. And yeah, it was a good outcome. Yeah, we never know, like, when something is going to come in handy in the future. You know? No. We don't. There's so many, so many things. You walk through them and you're like, why did this happen? There's a reason that it happened. But we don't know at the time. No. Nope. And we don't even think about that. We nope. just think about this sucks or this is really terrible I'm going through. And then you realize that that happened and you were able to help somebody else walk through a situation where you may not have been able to you know, comfort them or uh, provide them guidance, right? You walk through these difficulties and these challenges in your life. And the more that you have to deal with them, the more you can walk and help others through that experience that they're experiencing. So now when you find yourself in those types of situations, maybe not that big of a situation, but where things are really frustrating and you're like, uh, I, this sucks kind of thing. Do you step back a minute and wonder like, huh, I wonder how this might be helping me grow at all? Do you have those little internal conversations? Well, like I said, I just, this year was a very, uh, very difficult year. So I do think about things a lot differently. I do respond differently. Um, yeah, there's a lot, a lot that we should be grateful for. And I hear a lot of people complain about things, a lot of things. And I remind people, I'm a good reminder, I remind people that we are here in God Bless America. And we have more opportunity here 
You can do anything that you choose to. You can't do everything, but you can do anything you put your mind to. I remind them that we don't live in a third world country, that we're not in Ukraine getting blown up. You know, you really, really have to think about all the opportunity that is within us. I say there's something that happened and there was a fight about this something stupid. And I said, we're on the beach in Longport, New Jersey. It doesn't get too much better than this. Like, stop the nonsense of like, whatever the nonsense was at the time and be grateful and blessed that you have all these blessings in your life, regardless of the hardships that are also there as well. I mean, everybody has something. And sometimes, you know, uh, you have 20 pound of crap in a 10 pound bag, right? It's just overloading with stuff. And then other times things are easier. It's like the rain, it's like the weather. Yep. Yeah. If it That's was a really sunny, good point. If it was always sunny, we wouldn't know what it was like without sun. You know, that's so funny because we're here in the high desert and we've had like this crazy heat and um, but not bad, not bad for us. We can get worse. I mean, it can be hotter and hotter, but it's getting it's hot. But then it cools down at night, which is so nice. But the other day I'm thinking it feels like it's going to rain. And I thought. That would be kind of cool because when it rains in the desert, it smells like Christmas because like the sagebrush gets wet. Mm. And it smells like trees. To me, it does. So I've told other people, they go, really? Christmas? I'm going, okay, go with it, right? It does. It smells like trees. But it's like, it's just the sagebrush going, you know, or the pine trees around you. But I do think that's a super important thing to remember that there we go through these things and it provides contrast for us. Like if you don't ever see the sun, you don't appreciate when it cools down and it gets dark, right? Um, and we do have ups and downs in our lives. That's just the nature of being here on the on the planet. So that's right. It's a uh, it's all about the journey and enjoying the journey. About a decade ish ago, I had this goal, financial goal, and I made it that goal. And I literally, I'll never forget. I was so at the, it was more than a decade because I was at the other company. And I remember sitting there looking at the 1099 and then I looked around, I looked around and I'm like, nothing's changed. And that's when I decided that my goals weren't going to be about that and that enjoying the journey and having fun along the way is the most important part. The challenge, to be able to be challenged and figure out solutions, why we have be the solution. Oh, you can't see it now. I did. Part. No, I could see it. Be the solution. And... It's all part of just accepting that and enjoying the journey because you never arrive. When you get some, when you get to a point you want to be, then you're, if you don't have bigger aspirations than that, then you're going to be really disappointed. And I was disappointed. So I use my own experiences with what I talk about in the videos and podcasts and all these other things um they're real life things i'm like not making it up <laughs> so but maria you know before we hit record we were talking and it, it follows on to what you were just saying about like when you got your 1099 and you looked around nothing's changed right but we were talking about having that wake-up call like you think like you reach a point and then things are like ta-da so how do you approach that now? Like when you're growing a team, you're helping people think about things. What are some of the misconceptions people have about being in the field or working with you? I think that you have to have a greater why um, of what your commitment is. My commitment is to help others grow in the real estate field, rise in real estate, so help others rise up and have a deep passion for that 
And particularly it's for me, it's helping women um, get out there and in a two year time period to be six figure earners and remembering on the hard days that that's a commitment. You know, how many people can I leave a legacy with? And that is, has to be bigger than how much money I'm going to put in the bank. Because that changes from year to year, right? Real estate some years, you know, uh, they're great right now. And it's real tough for a lot of people. And it's all about staying power. It's about putting it, for me, like putting it all out there for free. Here's all of it. Everything I got. And then maybe the law of attraction will apply. Yeah. Well, and even if it doesn't come back right away, when you're putting yourself out there all the way, it just feels better. You know? Well, there's something about authenticity, right? It's, it's really, really important. And not everybody is going to like what you have to say, and that's okay. But the people that need to hear what you have to say will hear it. Maybe they won't hear it the first time, the second time, the third time, or time or the fifth time, but they'll hear it. And when they hear what you have to say, it resonates with them and you can help them along. You don't know who's watching. You don't know who's listening. You know, there's a lot of people out there that watch and listen and don't say anything. And I had a client uh, just before this and he said, I listened to the video about who makes the prices in the market. And he said, as you said, it's not me, it's not the seller, but it's the buyer. The buyers determine the price in the marketplace. You never could price a property too low because the buyers will bid it up. And if it's not getting any offers, the buyers have uh, declined your property. I also asked them, I say, if you were to purchase this property again, would you pay the price that you're asking for right now? I love that question. And you know what they all tell me? No. No. I said, so why would any other buyer? What do you think they're dumb? Yeah. I heard that used one time for someone who was like, they were selling things they had. They said, oh, I paid for this, blah, blah, blah. And the person said, but would you pay that again today? Well, heck no. Then the why would you think someone else would pay for it like that? Right. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So the buyers ultimately decide. Yeah. And if the property's horrible, it needs rehab, there's tons of people that will buy that. And if it's perfect, there's tons of people that will buy that. It's the middle of the, it's the middle called the, the messy middle, which is more challenging. Yeah. Well, it's interesting. We had to sell a property due to death not long ago as part of a trust. Thankfully. It was just my husband and his brother who had to make the decision. So it didn't have to go out to all the family. They were like the decision dudes. They communicated everything. But what was interesting is you're right. Like the, the buyers were determining what was going on. But the one thing I heard this couple say was they, where they wanted their kid to do their schooling was the school right down there. And when I heard that, I told my husband, I said, they're going to buy. And he goes, why would you think that? I said, because if that's where you want your kid to go to school, they're more concerned about that than the house itself. They want the proximity. They can fix the house up. They can do whatever they need with it. They're not going to jerk you around on this. And sure enough, they said, we want our kid in this school. And school starts, right? I just was telling you before, it just started this week. But um, that was their deciding factor. Not that it's in a great neighborhood, which it is, right? Not that it's close to downtown and proximity to other things, which it is. But it was that one deciding factor for them. So you Absolutely. never know. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. But and the there, realtor I, hung in there for a long time. Yeah. As I say, there's a lid for every pot. <laughs> oh, I like that. Um, so the wake up call then really is that we never really arrive. When we arrive, there's something else. We never really arrive. We just don't. You don't. If you're growing, so there's only two things. You're either growing or you're dying. 
you can't stay stagnant. So you always have to be growing. And in that case, if you're open-minded to growth and you're vulnerable and, you know, we all make mistakes. Um, when I make one, I say it, even if it's to the whole company, I made a bad decision on the hire and I apologize to everybody for the mess. And, you know, they didn't blame me, but I'm ultimately responsible party. So I knew some people were a little mad about something. So I publicly made that declaration that I take responsibility for this and I'm sorry. And we'll, we'll make sure that, you know, the next time people are vetted better or whatever. When you do that, Maria, what do you notice when you, when you take responsibility for that kind of thing? What do you notice happens with your team? Well, you definitely build more trust and respect. But you have to, you have to take swift action. You can't let things linger. I learned that. Um, no decision is making a decision. So I think one of the things that happens with business uh, owners, leaders, is that they fail to make decisions. And failing to make decisions costs a lot of money in case, in some cases. And we have to act quicker. We have to be able to be more open-minded and make decisions just faster. Um, I think it's really important, especially today. So now when you look for team members, are there characteristics besides their knowing what they're doing kind of thing, like their licensing and what they need to be in real estate? Are there personality characteristics that you personally are kind of looking for? That they should be a team player. They should be coachable. Um, they should be somebody who is believes in be the solution. Uh, they, I have a couple questions that I ask, and this is how it goes. I say, tell me about a time when you had an altercation with a boss or you didn't do your job, and I want to know what happened where you dropped the ball. And I would like to know, in hindsight, knowing what you know now, would you have done anything differently? So that's question one. Question two, tell me about something in your personal or professional life that you're the most proud of. And based on those answers, or those are my decision-making answers, if they answer them, first of all, if they throw the boss under the bus, or there's nothing that they say they would ever change, I would never hire them. Because? Because they're not open. They have a victim mentality. Um, they would, it would not work out for them here at all. And they're not accountable. And the other question is just a question to see, like, I want to know if they're gritty. I want to know about their character. I want to know that they were the first ones that graduated college and they pay for college themselves with me. I want to know what or what hardship they had that they had to overcome. And they tell me in that meeting, if they tell me something like, I, I, I don't know, I can't think right now of a, a bad example, but sometimes people say, not good answers. Um, yeah. Uh, I can't even... Well, not sincere answers, right? Not honest enough answers. Yeah. Kind of very surface level. Yes. And you're so looking for not... team members, so you really want to know a little bit more than just surface. Yeah. So that's not going to work either, right? I always ask, when's the last time you read a book or listened to a podcast? I also asked them if what they know about me. Always a good one. I bet you when I was hiring that always used, and it still does today, like people would want to go, I'd like to connect with you professionally. And the first thing they ask is, tell me about your business. And I'm thinking, are you kidding me? I'm not here to educate you. If you want it, it's out there on the internet. That's so right. Like, if you go to interview for a job and you, and you come to that place where you say, do you have questions for us? Can you tell me this? I'm thinking, 
you didn't even look at the website. That's all out there in public. I think this is not a good fit because you're going to be lazy. You're going to make the client work harder than you. So you're right. Those kind of questions really can um, show you something about the person and their thinking patterns. Not that they're bad or good, but whether those kinds of patterns or behaviors support the business you're trying to grow. Absolutely. I mean, it has to be able to connect dots in this business, especially if this thing doesn't happen, then it's going to affect the next dominoes down the lane. Yeah. So um, what's something you're looking forward to in your business over the next year and a half? Because I know the market shifts around a bit, so I'm not putting you out five or 10 years, but just in the next 18 months. I would like to launch a digital course for real estate agents. Um, I'm excited about that. On, on how to sell or what edge, real estate, aid, that's well, a big field. I, have, so. I do have about 90 topics, so I haven't figured out how many online courses I'm doing yet, um, but building a community. Yeah. Um, that we can support those people through, you know, weekly Zooms, uh, guest speakers, uh, specific tactical strategy, um, as well as, you know, the modules, um, and then perhaps uh, private, co you know, coaching and training as well. Yeah, that's powerful. How, how do you see community supporting folks? I know that's really more and more people are looking for community where they can, and, and the beauty of it being online is you don't have to even be in close proximity to the community physically. So how do you see that evolving over time or even over the past couple of years? But I'm thinking about where you're at right now. I think that there's still an enormous amount of opportunity in building communities. And we're a global world now like literally a global world. And so you can have customers and clients and fan base anywhere. Um, now you have AI, you can train your own AI to do <laughs> things for you. So I think there's so much opportunity. And, and then, you know, it's great to get together too in person, all right? Mm -hmm. So you can do have events and all kinds of things that, you know, connect. It's all about connecting, supporting, you know, people sometimes feel, especially in real estate, um, by them still alone. Yep. That whole isolation feeling, which doesn't need to be there. No. And sometimes you don't want to tell people how you really feel because, you know, they may look at you differently. Um, if you're struggling and going through a tough time. Nobody ever wants to talk about that, unfortunately. No, but you know what? It's real stuff. Indeed. It's real stuff. It is. And if we don't can't talk about it somewhere, what do we do with it? You know? It just well, each up. You see bottle up, bottled up, and then most people have like a shutdown or explosion or a breakdown. Yep. I think I've told this I, we were in uh Boston for a conference. This has been many years ago. I don't remember how the topic came up, but our cab driver's talking. We're looking at a picture of him and his wife, and it's late at night, and it's it's freezing cold. It is winter in Boston. It's cold, and it's so cold. oh, it's <laughs> cold. I'm thinking, oh, burr. Where's my hotel? But um, he was so great, and I think the gal I was with just asked him how long you've been married. What's what do you call the secret to your success of your long marriage? He says, well. We say it's the trash can effect. And I'm thinking, okay, this guy's got my interest. But it's basically what you said. He says, you can just never keep putting stuff in the garbage and tamping it down. He says, you get it out, you talk about it, because if you put it in there and you put a lid on it, it starts to stink after a while, right? And so it's like, we have to talk and be real about what's going on. And I, you know, so that piece about yourself learning and being vulnerable and taking ownership and being accountable those are powerful lessons, Maria, that set you up for being successful, not just in business, but just in, in general. Yeah, you, you look back on your life and you see all these different situations where it was a struggle. And each struggle 
made you stronger, right? And that's as long as you don't, you know, you can't take, you can't blame other people for even, you know, you hate your parents because they beat you up. I don't know, all these things that happen, right? Things that are not good. But you, if you carry it along with you for the rest of your life, you're just doing yourself a disservice, right? So you have to let it go somehow, you know, tapping, acupuncture, therapy. I don't know. But the more that you work on yourself and personal development, the better you are. So for your business, for your clients and family. So I believe in personal development and, you know, there's this thing is the shadow effect, right? We have this shadow on us of things that happened, but being able to let go of them and know that they happen. And, and they release, don't have to define you. No, releasing them into the world because we want to be at a high frequency. We want to have great energy. We're all just energy. So we can't have any energy people that are going to be zap us of energy. Um, I don't care if we're a client or not. They can't. We have to maybe release them back into the world. It can be just drain somebody else's energy. But that's you know, really important to protect your energy. And take care of it. Keep it clean. Protect it. It's some cleanup work that has to happen, though, to your point. And to take ownership of it. So, 100%. folks, <laughs> we've been talking a lot about Maria and real estate, but as you can see, we're talking about life in general and how to show up. She just happens to do it in that arena. So, folks who are in her geographic area um, can have the benefit of working with her and her team. And we're going to put the contact information for you in the notes. Um, I have my family, my dad's family was from Philadelphia. So I am fond of Philadelphia. Oh. I'm a little scared of the Philly Reds fans. They're a little fanatic for sure. Um, yeah. They weren't pleased when Giants fans showed up there, but they were kind. Nope. Nope. Serious. Dallas serious folks. Oh, really? Oh, they hate <laughs> Dallas. I mean, hate with a vengeance. You oh can't, it, it's very dangerous to go in the stadium with the Cowboys on and the Eagles. And, and, and God forbid you go into a, uh, a bar. I'll keep that in mind. Marie, yes. As we're wrapping this up, any final words of advice or encouragement that you want to give to women, either women who are looking to get into the business like you or Maybe millennial women who just say, I want to buy a house and I don't think it'll ever be possible for me. But any last words of encouragement? So I'll say you, you will only fail if you give up. So don't ever, 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 ever give up. If you stop and pause and you take a break for a second, okay, you get back at it. Because the only way that it won't happen for you, whether you want to buy a house or you want to create this fantastic real estate business, is if you don't take action and you give up. Other than that, if you take action every single day and you don't give up and you know that you understand the value of the compound effect, whether that happens for you positively or negatively, depending on what you're doing, and you'll realize that it will happen for you too. So it can happen for anybody who puts their mind to it. And you just have to believe. You have to believe in yourself. You have to have confidence. And you gain confidence by, make, by honoring your commitments. I made a commitment to make a video every single day. And uh, last night, it was 1040. And I had to go on video. So every day that you don't, honor your commitment that you made to yourself it eats at your integrity and it eats a little bit part of you inside but when you do things that you commit to it creates it gives you little bits boosts of confidence so then you get stronger and then you actually like look forward to doing that video or that that day at the gym 
or whatever it is, or more phone calls to potential clients. It gets easier because you got better, not because it got easier. Ah, I love it. I love it. Okay, well, thank you, Maria, for being a guest on the show. Folks, you know, it really is a help to us if you will rate, like, and rate this episode. But more importantly, I would request that you share it with someone who needs to hear what Maria shared today. Well, it might be you, but it might be someone you know, a friend of yours. So please share it um, because as Maria said when we were talking, you never know who's listening and who might benefit. And that's our goal here is to get the stories out of folks who have overcome, achieved, and not quit, and now are being able to lead and encourage others. So with that, thanks for joining the No Labels, No Limits podcast. You've been listening to the No Labels, No Limits podcast with best-selling author, change agent, and strategic vision coach, Sarah Box. You can grab the show notes and find out how to work with Sarah at sarahbox.com forward slash no labels, no limits podcast. We'd love this podcast to reach as many people as possible. So please remember to rate, leave a five-star review and share the podcast with someone you think would get value from this conversation. Until next time, keep taking those daily action steps to align your purpose to your principles and achieve your goals in business and life.